Hi, everyone, and welcome to JavaScript Marathon. Today we have Mike Ryan, who's going to be doing an advanced NGRX training, which means that you're going to, everything that Mike says is going to be like brand new and you've never heard of it before, unless like you are Mike Ryan, <laughs> right, Mike? I don't think so. <laughs> but maybe, maybe there'll be some surprises in there. <laughs> Just kidding. But Mike, we're so excited to have you. Um, do you want to introduce yourself real quick before we get into the training? Yeah, sure. My name is Mike Ryan. I'm a principal architect at a consultancy called Live Love App, and I do a lot of NGRX trainings. I'm also one of the uh, co-creators of NGRX, so I helped create this set of libraries that I'll be teaching you or training you on today. And I'm also a Google developer expert in Angular and Web Technologies. We're so, so excited to have you here. Cool. Excited. All right. Well, then let's just jump into it. Yeah, but you know, I do have to let you share your screen. So I just went ahead and enabled that. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So briefly, I just want to quickly introduce NGRX to those of you who may not have heard about it before. Um, it was originally founded by Rob Wormald, who was on the Angular team at the time, and it is a collection of open source libraries for Angular. And the idea is that all these libraries are built with reactivity. So we're trying to supercharge your Angular apps with reactive libraries to help you do everything from managing state to talking to your services. And we're mostly known for state management and side effect handling. And the libraries we're going to be teaching today are really going to zoom in on state management and side effects. I also want to highlight that it's completely community driven. It's all open source and done through volunteer work. So if you're interested in NGRX and you want to help out, feel free to join us at github.com slash NGRX slash platform and get involved. So the goal for today is to understand the architectural implications of NGRX and how to build Angular apps with it. And I'm going to try and show some advanced NGRX stuff along the way. But first, I want to demystify NGRX just a little bit for those of you who are still having a hard time wrapping your head around it. And if you've not gotten your head wrapped around NGRX, I think the best way for me to think about NGRX is that NGRX works a lot like Angular components. So I want to use components to kind of create this comparison between how NGRX works with something that you might already be using today in your Angular apps. So let's take a look at a quick sample application. Let's imagine we're building a simple app that lets you search for movies by name of director. When you search, the app reaches out to an API and loads in a bunch of results asynchronously. Then you can star your favorite films in the search results. So if we're to build this as an Angular app, what components would we need to build to create this thing? Well, for the search to work, we're going to first need to be able to list out these movies. So for every movie we get back from our API, we're going to create a movies list item component that renders that individual movie and lets the user hit that favorite button. From there, we're going to need a component that actually shows every single movie in this list based on the results we get back from that API, probably using something simple like an ng4. We're going to have a search box that actually lets the user type in the name of a director or some other search term. And then finally, we're going to have this overall page component that's going to tie all of this together. It's going to handle the interactivity from that search input, load up those results, pass them to the movies list component, which will then show each of those movies list item. So the hierarchy of this simple Angular app ends up looking a little bit like this. You have this search movies page, which has all this data, and it's going to pass it down using inputs to the movies list component. That movies list component is going to use ng4 on that list to show a movies list item for every single movie in that collection. When the user hits favorite on one of those movies list items, it's going to emit an output, letting the parent component know that, hey, someone hit the favorite button. And that movies list component will then redirect that back all the way up to the top to the search movies page, which will reach out to the API and actually mark that movie as favorited. Similarly, when the user searches for a movie in that search movies box, it will emit an event up to that search movies page component, letting it know that it needs to go refetch those results. So let's take a look at some code to see how this is working at the top of this component hierarchy. And I want to introduce a few terms that we're going to use throughout this training. So the first term I want to introduce is this term called state. So as the user searches for movies, this list of movies is updating dynamically and being passed through the components. And state refers to the data that changes dynamically as the application runs. So here, the state of this component is this list of movies. It's updating dynamically as the user searches for new movies. The next term I want to introduce is something called side effects. 
And side effects are essentially when your application needs to communicate with the outside world, needs to do something or talk to some service or some API. And here our component has to handle a side effect. When the user searches for movies, we need to reach out to our movies API and load in the new set of movies based on those results. And we're going to use the phrase side effect to refer to the action of calling out to our services. And when this side effect completes, we get back the new updated set of movies, which means we need to update the state of this component. We need to replace the old list of movies with the new list of movies we just gotten back from our API. In this process of changing state, we're gonna to refer to as a state change. And so this search movies page component, even though this is a simple Angular app, is actually doing a lot of different things. It's connecting state to components. It has that dynamic list of movies that it's passing down to its children. When the user interacts with these components, it's triggering side effects. It's reaching out to our services and making API calls. And when those API calls complete, it's going to change the state so that all the components are updated with the newest set of information. And from a communication perspective, we can see that what is happening is, our search movies can page is communicating and getting data from the outside world and passing all of that data down through all these components. And when the user interacts with these components, these changes are bubbling up, causing the search movies page component to communicate back to the outside world. And that's one of the first things that I want to reinforce as part of the NGRX mental model. When you're building NGRX apps, state flows down your Angular applications. And as the user interacts with your components, changes are going to flow back up, just like how this component's doing. But in an NGRX app, we don't want to have components that are doing a lot of different things. This search movies page component, as I mentioned, is connecting state to components, handling side effects, and updating state when those change. In an NGRX application, however, we want to adhere to something called the single responsibility principle. And the single responsibility principle states that for any given responsibility, you should have a single well-defined module of code that handles that responsibility. So this search movies page component, if we were to NGRXify it, can't do all of these different things. Instead, in an NGRX app, we're going to write our components in such a way that they only do one thing and do one thing well. And this search movies page component's single responsibility in an NGRX app is going to be to connect data to components. We're going to change it so that it is not handling state changes or calling our API services. So the way it's going to connect data components is using something that's a lot like inputs and outputs, only they're going to be NGRX versions of inputs and outputs. So real quickly, let's look at that movies list item component. This is one of the children components in our application hierarchy. This movies list item component receives a movie through an input, and when the user hits favorite, it emits an output using the favorite output. So kind of just a question for you. Does this component know who is binding to its input? Like, does this movie's list item component actually know who's giving it a movie? No, not really. This component's authored in a way where it doesn't care where the movie came from. Similarly, does this component know who is listening to this favorite output? And again, the answer is no, it doesn't really care. It's just saying, hey, someone's hit favorite, and it doesn't have to know which parent component is actually listening for this output. And there's a term for this in engineering called indirection. In an Angular app, inputs and outputs offer indirection between consumer and parent. So when you're writing Angular components using inputs and outputs, you're writing them in such a way where you don't have to really think or care about who's passing in data into those inputs or who's listening to those outputs. And in an NGRX app, we're gonna do something very similar. We're gonna introduce indirection throughout our Angular applications. We're gonna try and create indirection between the consumers of state how state changes, and how side effects are triggered. So the architectural diagram for this, I'd like to call this the million dollar slide, because this is all of NGRX on a single slide, even though it's still pretty opaque at this point. But the way an NGRX app is going to work is we're going to split up our Angular app into three primary modules of code, container components, effects, and reducers. And in order to achieve indirection, we're going to need to have some way for these modules of code to be able to communicate with each other without them knowing about each other. And the first way that we're going to handle this communication is through something called actions. Now, actions are the bedrock of an NGRX application. They are truly the gluten of the NGRX loaf. And they are a description of events that occur in your Angular applications. 
At their simplest form, they just adhere to the simple action interface. An action in an Nginx application just needs to have a type, and that type is a string describing where the event took place and what event happened. For example, when we get our movies back from our API, we could dispatch an action to represent that, hey, something interesting has occurred in our application. Our movies were loaded successfully, and here are all the movies we got back from our API. I like to think of actions as being a global output for your entire application. Anyone can dispatch an action, and any other module of code without knowing who dispatched that action can listen for those actions and do something interesting in response to those actions being dispatched. The first consumer of actions that I want to highlight are effects. Now, if you've used Indirects before, your experience writing Indirects effects was probably something a little bit like this. They are really complicated because this is where all of the hardcore RxJS comes into play when you're building NGRX applications. Let's take a quick look at what one of these effects looks like. And if it's confusing right now, don't worry, I'll get into more detail here in just a little bit. But actions have the ability to listen reactively for actions that get dispatched in your application. And when an action is dispatched, it can use RxJS operators to compose a service call. And we can reach out to our API services, make a call, and when those results come back from our API, we can then map those into new actions which get dispatched back to our store. And as all these actions are being dispatched from our components and our effects, we're gonna have another module of code called reducers that are gonna consume these actions. And reducers are gonna be functions that are responsible for changing state or telling NGRX how to change state. They can listen for every single action that gets dispatched to the store and they start off with some initial piece of state. Now, NGRX is gonna keep this in memory, this initial piece of state, and it's going to say, okay, every time I get an action in, I'm gonna call this reducer with this piece of state in this action, and this reducer is going to tell me what the next state should be. And I, as NGRX, Mr. NGRX, is gonna keep that state back in memory, that new result, and every time a new action gets dispatched, I'm gonna loop in the last state that I remembered along with the new action to figure out what the next state should be. So reducers are just responsible for figuring out or calculating where the application needs to go next. So from a code perspective, they're gonna look a little bit like this. We're gonna use create reducer and we're gonna start off with some initial piece of state. So in our application, when the app first boots up before the users had a chance to search for any movies, we're gonna start with an empty list of movies. And then once the users search for some movies and we've reached out to our API and gotten some results back, we can listen for that movies loaded successfully action, and we can say, okay, the next state in our app is the list is no longer empty. We're leaving that initial state behind. And instead the new state is gonna be the new list of movies we just got back from our API. So actually be the primary way that we communicate changes to effects and reducers, but we still need an indirect way for components to be able to read state back out. And to do that, we're gonna use something called selectors. And their responsibility is to help you bind state to your components. So they're gonna serve as the communication layer between the store and the components. If it helps for you to think of the store as a database, then selectors are kind of like the queries into that database. They can be really simple. They just take in all of the application state and they drill down and get some value out of that state. So here the selector is receiving the global state and it's returning the list of movies out from that store. Selectors are a lot like a global input for your whole app. Components can use selectors to read values out of the store without having to know anything about where those values are actually coming from. And that leads us to containers. We're looping back around to the starting point in our diagram. A container is just a special Angular component that knows how to talk to NGRX store. There's nothing special about it other than the fact that it uses the store service to read data out. So here it's injecting the store service from NGRX store, and then it's going to use selectors to pull data out. And when it pulls data out of the store using selectors, it actually gets them back in the form of an observable, which allows these components to use the async pipe to respond dynamically as that piece of state changes. And when the user interacts with the components, we're going to use that store service to dispatch actions back out to let those reducers and effects know that something needs to happen. So as we build this NGRX app during this training, I want you to really think to yourself that when we're using selectors, it's a lot like an NGRX version of inputs. We're just reading in data. We don't know where it's coming from, but allows our component to say, hey, I need this piece of data and for someone else to provide it. 
And when we're writing our component to dispatch actions, it's a lot like using an Angular output. We're just saying, hey, something interesting has happened in this component, and we don't have to care about who's listening for it or what they're going to do in response to it. Then that's the next part of the NGX mental model. We want select and dispatch in an NGX app to be special versions of input and output. So now the responsibilities are going to be clearly separated. We're going to write container components to connect data to the rest of our component tree. We're going to be writing effects today that are going to handle the side effects in our application. And we're going to author reducers to handle the state transitions in response to actions being dispatched. So as we're building this NGX app up, we're going to adhere to that single responsibility module. And we're going to delegate individual responsibilities to specific purpose-driven modules of code. So as we build this NGX app, this is the mental model. State's gonna flow down and changes are gonna flow up. We're gonna introduce indirection between state and the consumer of state. We're gonna use select and dispatch APIs and NGRX, a lot like we, how we'd use input and output in our Angular components. And all along the way, we're gonna adhere to the single responsibility principle. Now I'm gonna be going through some uh, demos today. If you wanna catch up with those demos and see what those are like, feel free to go to github.com slash this dot slash NGRX training. All the code samples are there along with the slides that I'm going through. So let's take a quick look at a demo. So this is the application that we're gonna be refactoring. I'm gonna change this traditional Angular app to be one that uses NGRX. And the app is pretty straightforward. It's just a catalog of some books along with the gross earnings that that book made when it went for sale. At the top, we're adding up all of the gross earnings of all the books in the catalog. I can click on a book to make some changes to it. So I can change the earnings here of this book and hit save. I can also create new books with some new earnings of their own and hit save to add those to the catalog. This is all being persisted to a database. So if I refresh the page, my changes have been saved. And of course, I can also delete books from this catalog. And as we do this, all of this data is updating live and dynamically. From a code perspective, our books page component looks a little bit like this. So as I mentioned, state is all the data that changes dynamically as its application runs. And there's three pieces of state that are changing dynamically as I interact with it. The list of books in the catalog, which I'm getting back from the API and updating by creating books, updating books or deleting books. There's also the current book. And this is referring to the book that is actively selected. So when I'm on this component and I click on a book, it lets me edit that specific book. And that's what that piece of the data is referring to, whatever book is actively being edited. And then there's also the total, the gross earnings total of all of these books added together, which is this up, just this number up here. It's adding up all of these values together to produce the gross total of all the books together. So this component is maintaining some local state and it's got some side effects that it is using to update or initialize the state. For example, in ng on init, we're calling get books, which is loading all the books back from our API and updating those totals. Similarly, when the user selects a book, we're updating that piece of state to mark which book is currently selected. So this component is not adhering to the single responsibility principle. It's maintaining state, it's calling side effects, and it's changing state when those side effects complete. And what we wanna do is we wanna update this component to use ngrx store so that it is only adhering to the single responsibility principle, which is connecting data to components. So to start our refactor off, we're gonna go with, we're gonna start off by writing actions, right? We need some way for our modules of code to be able to communicate with each other using this indirection idea. And actions are gonna be a unified interface that describe events as they occur. And these events can come from anywhere. These are just data. There's no functionality to actions. These are just data-driven descriptions of events that have occurred. We're not gonna put any methods or anything like that on these actions. As I mentioned before, at a minimum, these need to have a type property. For example, whenever the user selects a book, we could define an action that describes the user defining the book. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to first have to have this type. As I mentioned, every action must have a type and it must be a string. And this string, we're gonna use a specific format for it. Inside of the square brackets, we're gonna describe where this event took place. So this event took place on the books page. And then after the square brackets, we're gonna describe what happened in that location. So on the books page, the user selected a book. 
Now it doesn't just have to have a type property. We can add any additional data we want to to actions to describe or give context to it. So here we're gonna also add the book that the user selected. And what we can do is we can use the store service now to dispatch that action. So we can call this.store.dispatch and pass in that action to let anyone else know that, hey, the user has done this thing, you might wanna handle it. Along the way, we wanna add here to something called good action hygiene. There's a YouTube conference talk on this topic. If you just type in good action hygiene, you'll find it. And it's also pretty well documented in the NGRX documentation. But I wanna go over a few of these rules about what good action hygiene means. As we're writing actions, we wanna make sure that every unique event in our app gets a unique action. So every time the user can do something unique, we're gonna write a unique action for it. We're also going to group actions by source. So in this example, we have all these actions representing that the user is doing some things on the books page. We wanna group in our code, all of the actions that the user can take on the books page into one module of code. And this one's perhaps the most controversial, but actions are never reused. When you write an action, it only gets dispatched in one place in your Angular application. It's not meant to be reused. You're never gonna dispatch the same action in more than one spot in an Angular app. That kind of ties into that first property. Every unique event gets a unique action. Therefore, every unique call site to dispatch probably gets a unique action too. So if we're gonna adhere to good action hygiene, we're gonna to want to create a group of actions that represent all the things the user can do on the books page. They can select a book, they can add a book, they can update books, delete books, they can even enter the page. To create actions, we're going to use a function from NGRX store called create action. And this is gonna give us back a little factory for creating instances of actions. So here I'm creating an action that represents the user entering the books page. I call create action and the first and only required parameter that to supply to it is that action type. So here I'm saying that the action type is books page in the square brackets to represent where it's coming from and enter as the event that we're capturing. Like I said, what we get back from here is a little factory. So now this enter variable is a function that we can call to get back an instance of this action. So in our component now, we can call that enter factory to get back an instance of that enter action and pass the result back to store.dispatch. Create action takes a second parameter, um, which allows you to describe the properties or any additional data that you want to give actions. So for example, when the user creates a book, we probably wanna capture all of the parameters that the user typed into that form that they had to do to create a book and add that as context to this action. Once we've done that using this props function, what we can do now is when we call the create book action factory, we supply those parameters in as an argument to the create books factory, allowing us to add that data to those actions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a file that describes all of the actions that can be dispatched along with the data that we wanna to attach to those actions. We're gonna group them all up. Once we've done that, we're gonna go into our books page component. We're gonna inject the store service and we're gonna update it so that we're dispatching each of those actions um, as necessary in each of these handlers. An advanced tip for teams that are using NGRX is to do something called event storming. And this isn't something I've invented. There's a Wikipedia page on event storming, but it is a team building exercise that allows you to identify all the events that are arising in an application. And it's a great activity because it, the output of it is a really great input to actually authoring your actions. So to do event storming, the way I recommend you do it is to grab some sticky notes. And then as a group, looking at the design of this feature you're about to build, identify all of the events that are occurring in that design. What are all the ways the user can interact with the design that you're looking at? Then you can identify all of the commands that are causing that event to arise. So maybe the user can select a book and the command is the user actually clicking on the uh, book card itself. Once you identify the commands, identify the actor who's actually causing the event to occur. So in a lot of these examples today, it's the user that's gonna be causing the event to occur. They're gonna be the actor in the system. So now you've got some really interesting pieces of information. You've got where it's supposed to be, where are the events coming from, the books page. What caused the event to arise? Well, the user clicked on a book. Who is the actor? Well, it's the user. And then finally, you can identify all the data that needs to be attached to that event to give that event meaning or context. And the output of this exercise is basically your NGRX actions. 
Finally, I recommend keeping actions close to where they need to be dispatched in your code base. And we'll see this in the demo today, but you want to keep the actions and the definitions of those actions close to the components or the effects that are actually dispatching them. So with that, let's write some of the actions that we're going to need for our books page component. So in the code base, I'm going to go to the books page library, and I've got a little actions library right next to it where I'm going to put my books page actions. And inside of here, what I want to do is I want to do this event storming exercise to identify all of the events that can occur on this page. So if you look at this page, what are all the events that can occur? Well, I can come to this page I can enter it, right? I can click on the link in the menu to come to the books page. I can also select a book. I can delete a book. I can save a book or I can create a book. So what are all the events that can occur here in the system? We can enter. We can select a book. We can actually clear the selected book by hitting cancel. We can create a book, update a book, and delete a book. Now, who's actually doing this? Who's the actor? Well, in each of these cases, the actor is the user. And to denote that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say it's really the user on the books page. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit. I'm going to say that user is kind of inferred as part of this. So I'm just going to say the books page is where this is happening. It's the user on the books page is doing this. Once I've done that, I have my action types. And I can actually use these to go ahead and create the initial definitions of my actions. I'm just going to do some editor tricks here real quick to get these initialized. Now for each of these, I'm going to have to give them specific names. And then I also want to give them individual, I want to give them any data or context that is needed to give this action some definition. So for example, this next one, select book. Well, I probably want to know what book the user actually selected here. So what I'm going to do is in my second parameter to create action, I'm going to use the props function here to specify any additional pieces of data that give this action context. So the user selects a book, I probably want to know what the ID is of the book they selected. And I can keep doing this exercise. And what I will end up with are going to be the list of actions that represent each of the user events on the books page. So we have the user selecting a book. We have the user clearing the selected book. We have the user creating a book. And here we have what book that they just created. We have the user updating a book. And here we have the ID of the book that they've changed, along with any changes they've made to it. And we have the user deleting a book with the ID of the book that has been deleted. Now that I have my actions authored, what I wanna do is I wanna go into the books page component and update it to dispatch these actions as they are, or where the, um, these events are actually being handled by that component. To do that, I'm gonna go to the books page component. And the first thing I need to do is actually to inject the store service. So you can import store from at ngrx slash store once I have it. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to say private store is of type store. Now I have a few actions to dispatch. I have to dispatch each of these actions and each of the event handlers that is handling the event causing this action to be dispatched. So for enter, for example, I can call this.store.dispatch books page actions.enter. So here I'm using the ng on init lifecycle hook to capture the event of the user actually entering this page. And when the user enters this page, I'm going to call this.store.dispatch. And I need to supply it an action. And to create an instance of the action for this enter event, I can call books page.actions.enter, and I can call this to get an instance back out of it. Similarly, for saving a book, what I can do is I can go into the event handler for saving a book. And I can call this.store.dispatch. And here I need to give it an instance of the create book action that we authored earlier. So I'm gonna call it books page actions.create book. And this time I need to actually give it some data. I need to give it the book that the user has created, which I can pass book props into that I'm getting in my event handler. For updating a book, Fairly similar. We go in here. And I can call this sort of dispatch books page actions update book supplying the ID of the book that's being updated along with the changes the user has made to it. 
For deleting a book, again, very similar. I can call this that sort of dispatch. And I can pass in books page actions dot delete book with the idea of the book that's been deleted. Finally, for um, clearing the selection, I can go into remove selected book and I can call this dot store dot dispatch clear selected book. And for selecting a book, this dot store dot dispatch select book. Once I've done that, I've wired up this component to dispatch actions, but nothing is meaningfully happening with these actions yet because we're just dispatching them. Uh, no one's listening for them. But before we get into writing the bit of, bits of code that are necessary for listening for them, we actually haven't written all of the actions we need to write yet. You see, we've written all of the actions for capturing when the user interacts with the page, but in an Nginx app, there's more than one actor typically in an application. We like to think of everything being a, a stream in an Nginx application, and there's one more producer of actions. And that producer is going to be our API. So if we think about it, when we call our API, the API can actually return back a few different events. It can succeed, which is what we hope happens, right? When we call our API, we hope that API call succeeds and we get back whatever data or cause whatever change we're hoping to make. But it can also fail. We can have an error handler. And APIs can also com can complete. And in an Nginx app, what we want to do is we actually want to write actions that capture the success or failure of our APIs. So in addition to those user actions, we actually want to create actions that model the way our APIs respond. So let's go ahead and go back into our code base now. And what I want to do is I actually want to write some actions that represent our API calls. So the API calls right now are, if we look at our network tab and hit clear, there's a couple of things that are occurring. First, we get all the books back. We also have to handle deleting a book. We have to handle creating a book, updating a book. And so each of these are going to be individual API calls that we want to write actions for. So if I go into our code base, you can see there's already a file for books API actions. And what I want to do here is, again, do something very similar to that event storming exercise. And for each of those four API calls, loading the books, creating a book, updating a book, and deleting a book, I want to write actions for them. Now, in a normal application, I recommend writing actions for both success and failure. But to save a little bit of time today, I'm just going to do the success actions right now. So I have written a couple of actions real quickly for loading the book successfully, creating a book successfully, updating a book successfully, and deleting a book successfully. And now what I can do is I can go into my books page component and I can dispatch these new actions as well in each of those places where I was making that service call. For example, when we get all of our, AP, all of our books back from our API, we can dispatch an action representing that those books were loaded successfully. When we get back our updated or our saved, newly saved book, when we call the create book API, we can also capture that here by dispatching an action. I'm dispatching a book created action with the book that we just got back from the API. Same thing for updating a book. I can go in here, update my event handler here to, to get back the book that was just updated. And I can call books API actions that book updated and dispatch the action I get back from that call. Finally, when a book is deleted, I can do the same thing. I can call this sort of dispatch and dispatch a book deleted action to represent that book's been deleted. Now that we've written all of our actions, it's time to get into some of the consumers of these actions. And the first consumer that we're gonna author are reducers. Now, reducers produce new states. They instruct NGRX how states should be updated. And to do that, the store is going to call your reducer functions for you, and they're going to give it the most recent state that it has in memory, along with the next action that was just dispatched. And reducers can listen for specific actions. They actually get called every single act with every single action gets dispatched, but they have the ability to listen for specific actions to instruct NGRX how states should change when that action gets dispatched. And importantly, they're going to do all of this using something called pure immutable operations, which is a really fancy way of saying they're never going to change data that's supplied to them, 
they're just going to create new sets of data or produce new values in response to receiving the last state and the next action. So these are just functions. They're not going to look like functions because there's a lot of helpers that help you write reducers. But underneath the hood, I promise, these are just functions. And Indrex is going to call these functions for you every time an action gets dispatched. And they start with some initial piece of state that populates the store. And the reducer is going to tell Indrex, here's how to change state in response to this action. Here's your next state that you need to go to. And what the store is going to do is it's going to take that result and it's going to keep it in memory for us. And every time a new action gets dispatched, whatever the last piece of state was is going to get looped back into this reducer along with the next action. And the reducer is going to instruct Indrex once again where it needs to go next. So on our app, as I mentioned, there's a couple of pieces of state on this component. So if we go back and look at it, there's at least three pieces of data that are changing dynamically as this application runs. The list of books, the current book, and the total value of adding all these books together. And what we wanna do is we're gonna update this to use NGRX to manage the state. And for right now, we're only gonna manage two pieces of state using our reducer. We're gonna manage the collection, the list of books, along with whatever the active book is. And we're gonna save that total value for later because we're gonna handle that a little differently. So to create this, we're gonna create an interface describing the shape of the state. We have the collection and the active book ID. And then we need to create an initial state object that implements this interface to tell Indirect Store where the application should start when it first starts running. So before we've even had a chance to load the books from the API or the users have the ability to select the book, when this app first starts up, our collection is empty and the user has not gotten selected an active book yet. So we're gonna set that active book ID to be null. From there, we can use the create reducer helper from NGRX to define our reducer function. So we're gonna import create reducer from at NGRX slash store. And the first parameter that create reducer takes is that initial state object we just defined. This is gonna tell NGRX, hey, this is where you need to start off when my app first starts running. Every other parameter after that usually starts with this on function or this on handler. And what on does is it lets your reducer listen for specific actions. So here we're saying, okay, I wanna listen for the action that represents the user entering the page. Once you've defined the action you wanna listen for, you supply it a, a little callback function. And this callback function receives whatever the current state is in memory, along with the instance of the action you just specified you wanted to listen to. So here we're gonna get back an instance of that enter action. And this callback function is responsible for looking at state and that action and figuring out whatever the next state should be. So when the user enters the page, we're gonna keep whatever was in state before in that collection. So if we already had loaded books, we're gonna keep those books around, we're gonna kind of use this as a cache. And when the user comes back to this page for the first time, we're gonna set that active book ID to be null. And this is how we're gonna write these reducers. Now I'm gonna use some special syntax as we write these. Um, if you notice here, we're just, for the collection, we're just keeping whatever was in state beforehand, right? We're just saying, okay, I don't want to change where the collection was. I just want to set active book ID to be null. And we can simplify this a little bit by using something called the spread operator. So the spread operator is three dots, and we're going to use it on the state object to basically clone all of the things that were in state beforehand. And then after we use the spread operator, we can specify all the properties we want to change. So here we're keeping everything that was in state before, but we're going to set active book ID to be null. Now, create reducer can actually accept as many of these on handlers as necessary. So you could have as many on handlers as needed. Here you can see that I have an on handler for the user entering the page and an on handler for the user clearing the selected book. And in both of these cases, I want to set the active book ID to be null, but change nothing else that's in state. Now, this can be simplified because on in addition to having as many as you want, on handlers can actually listen for as many actions as necessary. So here we're doing the exact same thing in response to the user entering the books page and the user clearing the selected book. And so we can simplify this a little bit. We can say, okay, on the user entering the book page or the user clearing the selected book, let's change state so that active book ID is set to null. Now, those are a pretty simple example because we're not having to look at actions, but in a lot of your reducers, 
on handlers. We actually want to inspect action or state to figure out how to figure how to create the next state object. So when the user selects a book, we need to set active book ID to be the ID of the book that the user just clicked on. And to do that, we can read data off of those actions. So here we're saying, okay, when the user selects a book, let's keep everything that was in state beforehand. Let's set active book ID to be action.book ID. And this allows us to pull data out of those actions. So with that, let's look at a quick demo of how to write a reducer function. And we're going to listen for just a couple of the actions that we are dispatching right now. So I'm going to go to my code base. And what I want to do is I want to create a reducer function. And to do that, I'm going to look for, or I'm going to do this in a little separate from my books page um, library. And instead, I'm going to do it in a separate NX library for my shared state. So I'm going to go in here into my books.reducer file. And what I want to do is first, I want to define an interface that represents the shape of my state that I'm managing with this reducer. So I want to manage two pieces of property or two pieces of data. I want to manage the collection of books. I also want to manage whatever the active book ID is. I'm going to set this to be string or null. So it's a string when the user has selected a book pointing to the ID of the book that's selected. And it's null if there's no active book. Once I have my state interface, I want to create an initial state object that implements the state interface. So this application first starts up, we haven't had a chance to get any books back from our API. So the collection is going to be empty. And the user hasn't had a chance to interact with our page yet, so the active book ID will be null. Now that I have my state interface and my initial state object, I'm ready to write my reducer. So to do that, I'm going to create a variable called reducer, and I'm going to use the create reducer helper from NGRX store. And it requires at least one parameter, which is that initial state, telling NGRX where to start off when the application first runs. After I've given it the initial state object, I can then use on handlers to listen for specific actions to change state. So I can say, okay, when the user clears the selected book or when the user enters this page, let's change state such that we keep everything that was in state beforehand, but we set active book ID to be null. And when the user selects a book, let's change state that we're keeping everything that was in state beforehand, but we're setting active book ID now to be the ID of the book the user has clicked on. This is a simple example of a reducer. We have an on handler that's listening for clear selected book and the user entering the page. And in both of those cases, we are telling Indrix that the next state should be whatever was in state beforehand using the spread operator. But we also want to set the active book ID to be null. And when the user selects a book, we want to keep everything that was in state beforehand, but we want to set active book ID to be the ID of the book they just selected. So we've got this created, but we haven't quite wired it up yet. So what I want to do now is I want to get this wired up by setting up the rest of my store so we can start to see some of, the, some of these results. So to set the store, first we need to think a little bit about what the store is. So the store is kind of like the fanciest global variable in the world. All of the state inside of Indrix store is managed in a single variable in this state tree. Now, nothing is allowed to change the state. And you can read state from it, but nothing is allowed to change it. We call it the state inside of the store immutable. Nothing can change it. Instead, what happens is the store is going to figure out what the next state should be by calling the reducer function that we just wrote. And from a hierarchy perspective, what this will look like is something like this. Like I mentioned, it's a bit of a tree. Within GRX, you organize multiple reducer files into feature modules. And we're going to use an API called storemodule.forfeature to register all of our reducers. All of our application state, then, is a collection of all the features that have been registered using storemodule.forfeature. Another thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to use the store dev tools to instrument our store. This is going to give us powerful debugging tools to introspect 
our NGRX store and to see what state is contained inside of it. So let's take a look at what this is going to look like from a code perspective. So right next to the books reducer file, I have this state file. And inside of here, some things have already been set up for us. You'll see here on line 25, I have an ng module that's calling store module for feature. This is how we're going to register all the reducers that belong to this feature module. Every feature module needs to have a feature name or a feature key. So because this is the shared state module for the books, I'm going to call this the shared books feature. After we set up our key, we then pass in all of the reducers that we want to register. This is going to be a dictionary naming each of the reducers we want to set up. So to do this, first we need to update the shape or the state of this entire feature. So we have this books reducer and it has a little bit of state contained within it, but this entire feature needs its own state interface as well. So we're gonna say all the book state is managed underneath the books property. So the books property in this feature points to this state interface that we created for our books reducer. Once we've done that, TypeScript is letting us know that we need to actually register the reducer function for it. So we're going to say, okay, for the book's state, manage it using the book's reducer. These reducers are wired up using store module for feature. And so now the hierarchy of this is going to be, we kind of go back and look at that hierarchy diagram. Our application state has one feature and that feature is the shared books feature. And we've set up our books reducer to be a child within that feature. Now that we have this wired up, I'm also going to go turn on the dev tools, which has already been done for you. If you go look at app.module.ts, you can see on line 37, we're using the store dev tools module to instrument NGRX store, which is going to let us use powerful debugging tools on NGRX. To install it, those dev tools, what you want to do is you want to look up the Redux dev tools extension, and it should be available to you on the Google Chrome, um, extension store, I believe it's also for Firefox and a number of other browsers as well. Once you've installed the Redux DevTools, we can go back to our application and there'll be a new tab in our developer tools called Redux. And if I select that, you can see that it's already connected to our NGRX application and we can see all of the actions that we wired up earlier. So now as I delete a book, we can see an action getting dispatched for deleting that book. In addition to seeing all the actions that are being dispatched, I can also go into the state tab and I can inspect the state of our application. So here's our entire state tree. You can see here we have our NGRX feature module, shared books, and underneath it, we have our books reducer. And so the book state right now, we have that empty collection. We have the active book ID set to null. And if I select a book and we go look at that action, you can see that active book ID gets set to the ID of the book. Our reducer is being called and calculating what's next. In fact, I can use this diff tab to quickly see what exactly is changing in each of these action calls. When I hit cancel to clear selecting it, I can click on that and see that our reducer is being called and setting that active book ID to be null. So now that we've set up the store, we need to go back to our reducers and we need to update that reducer to listen for the rest of the actions that we're dispatching. And to do that, we need to talk a little bit more about this idea of immutability. So as I mentioned, all of the state contained within the store needs to be unchanged. We are not auto mutate it. Instead, our reducer is going to be responsible for updating it to be whatever is next. And to do that, I've added a couple of simple helper functions, which, are, which you're welcome to go into and look at a little bit more. But these helper functions are going to help us update this state in an immutable way. It's going to let us add books to our collection, update books in the collection, and remove books in the collection without actually changing the array. Instead, all of these helper functions are going to create new arrays with those changes applied. So with these helper functions, we can now go into our reducer and we can listen for the rest of the actions that we have not quite set up listeners for yet. So let's go into our books reducer and let's reduce some more actions. So first, Let's listen for whenever the books are loaded from our API. 
when the books are loaded from our API, we want to keep everything that was in state beforehand, but we want to set the collection to be the list of books we just got back. When a book is created, we want to clear whatever the selected book currently was, and we want to use that create book helper that's already been supplied for you to add the newly created book into the collection. When a book is updated, we want to do something similar. We want to set the active book ID to be null. We want to clear the active book ID, but we also want to update the book in the collection using the newly updated book we just got back from our API. And then finally, when a book is deleted, we want to remove that book from our collection. So if I hit save now and go back to our application, when it runs, when the books loaded successfully, we should see that all those books got added to the collection that we got back from our API. When I create a book and hit save, we can look at that book created action to see that it did indeed insert that book into the collection. If I click on it to edit it and change those earnings and hit save, we should see that the earnings property was updated. So I think we changed. And then finally, if I delete that book, we can use these dev tools to see that the book was indeed removed from the collection. So now that we're updating state inside of the store, we need to update our component to actually read the data out of the store instead of maintaining its own local state. And to do that, we're gonna to need to use selectors. Now, selectors are like the database queries for a database. They allow us to query data out of the store. And they're really neat because they recompute dynamically. This is gonna allow us to build reactive Angular applications that change dynamically in response to those reducers producing new states. They're also super, super performant. Selectors are the key to NGRX applications being really fast because they fully leverage memoization to avoid unnecessary calculations. And they're fully composable. We can use selectors to create new selectors to create new selectors. So let's take a look. The simplest selectors are these property selectors. All they do is they receive the state object and they get out some property on that state. So here we have a selector to select all the books, which is fairly straightforward. We can just say, okay, given the state, Let's use state.collection to get those books back out. Similarly, if we wanted to get the active book ID, we could call state.activebookid to get that piece of data out. But what if we wanted to select the active book, right? We have a selector to get all of the books and we have a selector to get the active book ID, but what if we wanted to get the actual instance of the book that's being selected? Well, selectors are composable. We can actually use these two selectors to figure out whatever the active book is. So here I have select active book. You can see I'm getting the list of books by calling my select book selector, and I'm getting the active book ID by calling my select active book ID selector. And once I have these two pieces of information, I can call books.find on that array to find the book that matches the ID of the active book ID, or I can return null. In GRX, gives us a utility function to make writing these kinds of selectors a little easier. We can use create selector and pass in that select books selector and the select active book ID selector um, to quickly create a select active book selector. And what we're doing here is create selector takes any number of parameters. The first n minus one parameters are all the selectors we want to consume. And the final nth parameter is going to be a callback function that takes the results of all of those previous selectors and gives you those results inside of this little callback function that you can then use to figure out or calculate the piece of state you're trying to create. And what's really great about this API is create selector is super, super smart. Create selector will only call this callback function whenever the results of the select books or the select active book ID selectors change. So these selectors will memoize or keep or retain whatever value you produce and will only call your callback function, your little factory function, whenever its inputs change, giving you a really big performance win. Now I mentioned earlier that we were not gonna maintain the total gross earnings inside of the state. And the reason for that is we can actually use a selector to figure out whatever the gross books earnings should be. 
by using create selector, we can use or consume that select books selector and say, okay, whenever any of the, whenever the books collection changes, let's take those books and let's call our calculate gross books earnings function on that list of books to figure out the gross earnings total. And if you notice the function signature of our projector function, that final parameter matches the function signature of calculate gross books earnings. And so we can simplify this a little further and just say, okay, we're gonna create a selector that selects all the books and then passes all those books to calculate gross books earnings. Now I wanna mention a couple of things about this. As you can see, selectors are consuming other selectors. And this is gonna create basically what's called a graph of data. So each of these white dots, white circles, represents one of your selectors. And what we're going to do in our NGRX application is some of these components are going to listen to these selectors. For example, let's say that the orange circle is being actively consumed by one of our components. Whenever the component subscribes or applies that selector, NGRX is going to intelligently call all of the selectors that it depends on and calculate their results as well to build out this data tree. And NGRX is really, really smart. If a completely different component somewhere else subscribes to another selector that shares some of the dependencies of the first selector that was being subscribed to, NGRX is not going to recompute all of the pink circles. It's going to retain or save those values and pass them in. Instead, NGRX is going to intelligently only call the, the selectors that are newly dependent from that. So keep this kind of graph in mind that you're building out this rich data graph. And I'd encourage you to optimize your Angular applications by writing a ton of these selectors with few inputs. It's okay to write lots and lots of small selectors and chain them together using composition. You'll probably get the best performance out of your Angular application if you write it this way. So let's take a look at a demo of how to write a few of these selectors. So I'm going to go back into our code base, and I'm actually going to write these selectors in the same place where I wrote, wrote my reducer. And the reason for that is they're really a tied to this state interface. The reducer cares a lot about the shape of state, and so will selectors. So I tend to keep these inside of the same file just because they're so related in terms of the concerns that they're managing. And at the bottom, I'm going to write a couple of selectors. First, I'm going to write a select all selector that gets all of the books out of state. And to do that, I can just call state.collection. I also want to write one that gets me the active book ID. So here I'm just creating a function that gets in state and returns back out active book ID. Using these two, I want to write one that gets me the active book. And to do this, I could say, okay, well, all of my books can be used can be retrieved using select all on state. And the active book ID can be done using my select active book ID selector on state. And once I have this, I can return books.find and look up the book whose ID matches the active book ID or return null. I can optimize the performance of select active book by instead using create selector to get some memoization here. So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to call this the one booked active book with bad performance. I'm going to write one with better performance by using my create selector helper from NGRX store. Now the format of this is fairly similar. You can see here that we have inputs to the selector, and then we have what's called a calculation to figure out the piece of state we want to calculate. And create selector works very similar. At the top, we list our inputs. So we need all the books using the select all selector. And we need the active book ID using the select active book ID selector. And then the final parameter is going to be a callback function that receives the data from our inputs. So since select all is first, the first parameter to this projector function is going to be the list of books. And since the second input is the active book ID selector, the second parameter of this projector will be the active book ID. So there's a correlation between the order of our inputs and the order of the parameters for this projector function. And now that I have this data, you can see TypeTrip is inferring all of our types correctly here. We have 
act books as a collection, active book ID being string or null, we can do our calculation inside of this callback. And so now we have, again, these are identical in terms of what they do. They both figure out what the active book is, but the second version's got better performance because we're using this create selector helper, which is going to give us a memoized selector that only calls this projector function when any of our inputs change. So I can go ahead and delete the version with bad performance. And then finally, I wanna write one to select the earnings total. And to do that, I can say, okay, I've got my state. I'm gonna need all of my books. And then I can return, calculate books gross earnings totals on that list of books to figure out the total value of all my books, my collection. And again, this doesn't have the best performance. We're not leveraging the memoization that create selector gives us. So we can refactor this to instead use create selector. And here, our first input is select all. Once we do that, our input here will be the list of books we got back. And now we can call calculate book gross earnings on that list of books. But if you notice the function signature of our projector function and the function signature of calculate books gross earnings are the same. So I can simplify this once more by just passing that in as a projector function. Don't let this confuse you. This is still the input and this is the projector. It's just we can pass this function directly in as a projector instead of having to write one out by hand. So we've got some selectors, but we need to do a little bit more work and that we need to make these available to the rest of our application to actually consume. You see, these only work on this local piece of state. But as I mentioned before, NGRX gives you your entire state as a state tree organized by features. And so we need to go to our feature state module and we need to export our selectors here. To do that, First, we need to write a selector that actually gets all of the books in state. Now, to get our book state, I'm going to use create selector. And I've already got a selector written here called select shared book state. This is going to get us this entire um, feature module's worth of state. And once I have that, once I have the shared books feature state, I can drill down to get the local book state from that object. Now that I have that, I can use the local selectors I wrote here, along with this global selector that gets me all of book state, and I can compose them together to create versions of these selectors that can be used on the entire state object. For example, if I wanna be able to select all the books out of the entire state graph, I can use select book state to get all of the book state. And then I can say from books, select all. So what's happening here is I've got to create selector and I'm getting all the book state. So I've got my book state here. And now I can call this select all selector, which works on books state and pass it in to get all the books out from there. But because the signature of this projector function matches the signature of this selector, I can simplify it by saying something like this. And I can do the same thing for selecting the active book. I can say, okay, using the book's state, use the book's selector to give me the active book. And to get the earnings totals using the book state, give me the earnings totals using that local selector. So now that I have these two pieces in play, it's time to actually consume these selectors inside of our books page component. Now, right now, our books page component has local state on it. It's got the list of books. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace this with an observable representing that piece of state. So instead of having that local array of books on it, we're going to have an observable of an array of book models. And to populate or initialize this observable, we're gonna use our selector we just wrote along with the store service to select all of those books. 
And that will return to us an observable of that piece of state that will emit a change every time the selector calculates a new value. Once we have this set up, we can go into our template. And instead of just consuming that value directly, we can now replace it with a call to that observable. So books, and then to unwrap it or to consume the value inside of this observable, we're going to use the async pipe to subscribe to the changes of that observable. So let's take a look at how we're gonna refactor this component now to use these selectors we just wrote. So I'm gonna go into the books page component. And the first thing I need to do is I need to change this so that it's no longer maintaining local state. So I'm gonna remove all these property initializers here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change these to be, instead of just their raw direct values, I'm gonna wrap these up in an observable. And I'm gonna put a dollar sign at the end of each of these property names, just to denote to me that these are each streams or observables. Once I've done that, I can see my editor's giving me a few errors of things that I need to go change. And the first thing I need to change is I need to actually initialize each of these properties in my constructor. So I can say that these dot books, well, to get an observable of all the books in state, I can call store dot select, select all books. To get the current book, I can call store dot select, select active book. And to get the total, I can call store dot select, select books earnings totals. So this is populating or initializing each of these observables by connecting them to state contained in our store, which we are selecting out with our selectors. Now, this component's not maintaining any local state. Instead, it's reading all of its state from the store. So any place in this code that was referencing the local state, now I can just delete it because that's all being managed by our reducer now. So I can remove each of these little functions or call sites where I was maintaining that local state. And hit save. And the final thing that I need to go change is the template because these are now observables instead of being direct values. So I'm going to update those names to add that dollar sign at the end. And then you can see that I'm being told that the types don't quite match. Observable of, an observable of a number is not assignable to a number. So to get to the direct value, I'm gonna use the async pipe to subscribe to that observable. I'm gonna do this in the rest of these places. So I've updated my template and now I should be able to go back to my app and it should still work. I should still be able to create a book with some earnings, hit save, see all the things that are updating live, but there's a new trick here. So I'm gonna make some changes. I'm gonna change the adventures of Pinocchio to have a few more earnings, hit save, I'm going to delete this book here. I'm going to select a book. I'm going to hit cancel. And if we go look at each of these actions again, we can see that the state was changing. But now that our component is bound to the store, we can actually use the rest of these dev tools to do something called time travel debugging. So as I scrub here and go back in time to other actions, we can see our Angular app updating live and dynamically in response to this. So I can inspect what my app looked like at various points in time. So when we first started our app, when we first entered the page, before we even made any API calls, you can see we had no books in our collection and the user hadn't selected a book yet. Once we loaded our book successfully, we updated that list of books. When the user selected a book, we changed that form. When the user updated a book, we can see that we cleared the selected book and the change was reflected in the UI. And so we can use these time traveler debuggers to get really fine grained control and introspection into our Angular app in response to each of these actions being dispatched. So we've almost finished up here. If we go look at this book's page component, we've already made some significant progress in refactoring this to adhere to the single responsibility principle. It's no longer managing local state or state transitions. We've moved those into reducers. It's also dispatching actions, almost like global outputs to denote when unique events are occurring but it's still doing one responsibility that we need to refactor. And that's that it's calling services directly. We wanna update this component to no longer be calling these services. And to do that, we're gonna write effects. Effects are the second consumer of actions in Indirects app. That first consumer being the reducers. We've already written a reducer that's listening for certain actions and changing state. 
Now we want to write effects that are listening for actions and calling our APIs for us. And effects are a little mind bendy. They run in the background of your Angular app. They are completely disconnected from your components altogether. And instead they kind of run as processes independent of your component tree. And they're responsible for connecting your app to the outside world. This is where you call services. I think the hardest part about effects is so far, we've managed to avoid writing too much RxJS. Effects are where we write a lot of our RxJS code because we declare or define effects entirely using RxJS streams. So I've already got a books service that I can use to load books by ID, get all the books, create books, update books. And I'm not gonna change anything about this Angular service. We're still gonna write Angular services to capture the logic of connecting to our APIs. What's gonna be different is I'm gonna write new Angular services called effect services. These are still classes and we're still going to use the injectable decorator on them, but they're gonna be a little bit different in that no one's going to actually inject these services. These services are going to use probably at least one service called the actions service. And this comes from NGRX effects. And it's a special observable of all of the actions that are getting dispatched by your components and by other effects. In addition to that action service, we can also inject any of the other Angular services that we've already written that we wanna call inside of our effects. From there, we're gonna add properties to this Angular service. And each property is gonna be an independent effect that NGRX is gonna to subscribe to and run for us on our behalf. To create an effect, we're gonna use the create effect utility function from at NGRX slash effects. And create effect takes a callback function that produces or creates the effect itself. So an effect is just an RxJS stream or observable. And it usually, though not always, starts off by using the actions service. And we can use a special operator that comes with NGRX effects called the of type operator to listen for specific actions as they are dispatched. So here we're listening for the user entering the books page. And when the user enters the books page, what we wanna do is we wanna call our books service to load all the books in. So we're gonna use a higher order mapping operator called merge map to map this action into a new observable and then flat it all back out. And don't worry too much about why I chose merge map yet. Um, if we have time, we'll get into which operator to use for the right effect. But for now we're gonna use merge map to map our enter action into a call to our book service to load up all of the books. Now, the thing that's fun about NGRX effects is once we've called our service, we actually need to map that result, the success of getting all of our books back into a new action. So here we're gonna use the map operator to take all those books we just got back from our book service and map it into a books loaded action. And what NGRX effects is going to do is it's going to look at this Angular service and it's going to find all of the effects properties on it and it's going to subscribe to it. So this is going to create this little process in the background of our Angular application that's listening for every time the user enters the books page and calls our book service to load up all the books, mapping it to a books loaded action. And then NGRX is going to subscribe to this effect and dispatch this action for us on our behalf. To wire it up, we can use the effects module from NGRX effects and call effects module.forfeature, passing in all the Angular services that we've written that have effects on them to it. So let's write our first effect real quick. So I'm gonna go into our code base. And what I recommend doing is I recommend keeping effects closest to the features that are actually gonna be using them. So instead of doing it next to our reducer, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna keep it close to the books page component. And you can see here I already had a file created called books API effects. I'm just gonna clear some things here out. Now I've already scaffolded out a service and this service is injecting two things. It's injecting the book service, which we're gonna to need to use to call um, our API. And it's also got an actions service, which is gonna be an observable of all of the actions that are being dispatched in our application. So to create an effect, what I need to do is I need to add a property to this class. And I'm gonna call this the load books effect. And a define effect, I'm gonna call the create effect utility function. 
from NGRX. And I'm gonna return here a new observable that NGRX is gonna subscribe to. So to start off, I'm gonna use the action service. I'm gonna say, okay. What I wanna do is I wanna set up an effect that listens for every time the user dispatches or whenever the user enters the books page, causing this action to be dispatched. Whenever that happens, I'm gonna call merge map or I'm gonna use my merge map operator to map this action into a service call. So I'm gonna say, okay, whenever the user enters the books page, I wanna call my book services all method to load in all the books from my API. Now you can see TypeScript gave me a bit of a warning because what I've done is I've created an observable of a list of books. But what I need is I actually need to return an observable of actions here. And so I need to map all the books that I get back into an action. So I'm going to use the map operator from RxJS. I'm going to call books API actions that book books loaded with the books I just got back. And so now I have an effect that every time the user enters the books page, we're going to reach out to our service and call um, the all method on it to load all the books back, map that into a new action that's going to get dispatched back to the store. Now my books page module, you can see here that I have called my effects module dot for feature, passing in this Angular service directly into it, registering these effects. So if I go back to my application, we can see in our dev tools that we actually see books loaded success happening twice. The reason for that is that on enter, our effect is running and loading all the books. But we've not removed the service call from our component. So our service is actually being called two times when the application starts up. So I can go to my books page component and I can remove the place where I'm calling this.bookservice.all. So I can actually remove this entire get books function in any place that was calling it beforehand. So I've completely removed that service call. This component is no longer trying to get all the books. Instead, we've moved that responsibility to this load books effect. And now when I run the app, the app still works. And we can see that we're loading our books successfully because this effect in the background listened for this action, the user entering the books page, and went and loaded all the books for us. So we've changed that, but there's a few more service calls that we want to try and refactor. And so that's going to get into some advanced effects topics. So this is what our effect looks like right now. And as I mentioned, we're using this merge map operator to, to call our service and flatten it all back out. But there's like a lot of mapping operators. So what map operator should you use when you're writing your effects? Well, there's four higher order mapping operators for us to consider. There's merge map, concat map, exhaust map, and switch map. And these each have different or subtly different behaviors on how they actually flatten out our streams. And the way I like to think of them is I like to think about my time going to the post office to ship off boxes. Now, let's say I have a package and I want to get it shipped. And I go into the post office and somebody is already in line trying to get their package shipped. Well, if we were using merge map, what would happen is both me and the other person would both race up to the postmaster with both our boxes in hand, throw them at the postmaster, and then walk away. And the postmaster is going to get them both shipped for us, but there's no guaranteed order to whose box is actually going to get shipped off first. All the boxes do get shipped, but there's no guaranteed order here. And we kind of just had chaotically just ran up to him. Well, that's not quite how it works. Um, instead, kind of the fair way that it would work is if we had used concat map. Let's say me and this person both show up. That person gets in line and they're working again, their package shipped. If I showed up now with my package and they're still in line, what I'm going to do with concat map is I'm just going to get up in line behind them, wait for them to finish, and then I'm going to get my turn to get my package shipped off. Here, there's no chaos. Everyone's package got shipped and they got shipped in the order that we appeared. The other person came to the line first, so their package got shipped off first. I came second, so my package gets shipped off of shipped off after them. So concat map is really fair. Unfortunately, the post office seemingly works more like exhaust map than it does concat map. 
I show up with my package. I see that somebody else is already in line. I'm like, oh, this is going to take forever. And I just leave. I don't even get my package shipped. I was like, whatever, this is going to take way too long for me. This person's already in line and they're taking forever. So with exhaust map, what has happened here is because somebody else was already in line, I'm not getting my package shipped. That's just forget about it. That's not going to happen. Instead, the first person who showed up first and who was in line will get their package shipped off. Now, the way I wish the post office worked was like switch map, where I show up to the post office, I see somebody's in line trying to get their package shipped, and I just push them out of the way, throw away their box, and instead I get my box shipped off. I just completely discard them, forget about them, forget about their package, but that'd be a little rude. And so with each of these, there's some pretty different behaviors. And specifically with three of them, there are race conditions. With merge map, everyone's packages got shipped but there's no guarantee whose package got shipped when. With exhaust map, I didn't get my package shipped because I wasn't gonna wait around for the first person to finish shipping their package. And with switch map, the person who was there first, their package didn't get shipped because I pushed them out of the way and I threw their box in the trash. So there's all some race conditions to consider with merge map, exhaust map, and switch map. So if you're like, okay, I'm writing an indirect effect, which of these should I use? And you're just not sure, always reach for concat map. It is the safest operator for you to use in your applications. But be aware that there's a risk of back pressure. And what back pressure means is that since everyone needs to get their package shipped, if that line gets really, really long at the post office, the person who's last in line is going to be waiting a really long time. And so with ConcatMap, we're processing things in order one at a time. And that can lead to situations where your effects maybe start to slow down, things are taking a little bit longer to process because you've built up this queue of things that need to be resolved. So always reach for concat map if you're not sure, but just be aware that there's a little bit of a performance consideration there for some kinds of effects. So I have this key that I like to use for when I'm writing my effects that tell me which operator to use based on the kind of operation that I'm trying to accomplish. So if I'm writing an effect that deletes items, it's okay to use merge map, right? We need to delete all the items, but it doesn't matter which order they get deleted in. Let's just get them all cleared out as fastly and as efficiently as possible. On the other hand, if I'm writing an effect for updating or creating items, it probably matters that I do these things in order. And so let's use concat map. And again, we're gonna use concat map because we don't wanna discard any updates or creations. Like we want all the users updates and creates to be applied. But let's do them in order so that they happen in the way the user expects them to. For non-parameterized queries, like the one in our application where we're getting all of the books, let's use exhaust map. It doesn't matter who got there first because we're all looking for the same thing. We all want all of the books. So whoever got there first and asked for it, great. We don't need to issue any new requests. Let's use exhaust map. On the other hand, if we had a parameterized query, like we had a filter on it, well, we don't care about any outstanding requests to go get those pieces of data. Let's use switch map to discard any of our um, outstanding queries and just care about the last one that got issued. So using this key, if we go back and look at our books effects, merge map's not quite the right operator. We're making a non-parameterized query. So we can improve the performance and the predictability of this effect by using exhaust map and saying that whenever someone enters this books page, let's just get all, the, all of the books for them if this request is still outstanding when somebody else asks for a book, that's okay. We'll eventually resolve this anyways. So now let's jump back into this code and let's replace this merge map with a call to exhaust map to use the right operator for this type of effect. And now that we know which operator to use, we can write a few more of the effects that we need to write. For example, we can write an effect for creating a book. So you can see here, we're listening for whenever the user creates a book, we're calling our book service to create that book, and then we're mapping that into a book created action. And because this is a creation effect, we're gonna use concat map to make sure that we are applying each of these creation events in the order that the user dispatched or caused them to occur in. Similarly, we can do the same thing for updating books. We're gonna use concat map to make sure that updates are applied in order. I'm gonna call the update method on our book service. And then for deleting books, we can actually use merge map to make sure that we are applying all the deletes, but we don't care about order. We just wanna make sure they all happen. And so we can do this very efficiently just using merge map. 
And now that we've written effects for each of these API calls, we can now go to our books page component and we can remove the book service altogether. Any remaining calls to it can be cleaned up and deleted because these are all being handled by our effects. And so now if we run our application, I think it should still work. We've loaded up all the books. I can create a book with some earnings and hit save. That's all happening thanks to our effect. I can update this book's earnings. That gets applied thanks to our update effect. And I can delete a book and that gets handled thanks to our delete effect. And now we've done it. This entire Angular component has been refactored to remove all the additional responsibilities that we identified earlier. This component is now doing just one thing. It's using the store service to read data out of the store and connect that data to its components. Whenever those components are interacted with, this component just simply dispatches actions to let some other module of code that has no knowledge about know that something interesting has occurred. We've written a reducer that listens for those, some of those actions and tells NGRX how to update state and response to those actions. We've written selectors that allow us to query data out of the store for our components to consume. And we've written effects to handle calling side effects or API calls in response to some actions being dispatched. So along the way during this refactor today, we've adhered to a few of those mental models of an NGRX application. We've refactored this app so that all the state is flowing down through our components. And as the user interacts with them, changes are flowing up. We've introduced indirection between the state and the consumer of state. No one really knows about each other. Our reducers are written in a way where they don't know about the effects that caused actions we dispatched or the components. Our components are written in a way where they have no idea about the reducers and the effects. And our effects are written in such a way where they have no idea about reducers and components. There's indirection between all these modules of code. We've used store.select and store.dispatch inside of our container component, just like we would use input and output. That container component is consuming data without having any idea where that data is coming from. And it's dispatching actions to represent events that it had no idea, um, that, and it has no idea who's actually listening for those. If you want to view these slides and more, they're available to you. Um, again, those are at github.com slash this, this dot slash indirect training. All the slides I've gone through, all the code samples and more are, are all available to you as part of this training. Additionally, there's a few more talks that I'd like to recommend in case you want to dive deeper into some of the concepts that I've covered today. So I've already mentioned my good action hygiene talk that will help you author really high quality actions. I also recommend a few testing talks. There's reactive testing strategies by Brandon Roberts and I that help you test NGRX applications. I also recommend authentication with NGRX by Brandon Roberts if you want to learn more about how to build authentication using this. Um, I also always like to save this one for the end. You might not need NGRX. I've taught you how to use it today, but you probably don't need it for your Angular applications. And I've given you a talk on some ideas of when you may or may not need NGRX for Angular application. There's also a lot more to NGRX that I don't have time to cover. There are schematics that help you scaffold out a large amount of the code that we've done today. So you can use schematics with the Angular CLI or the NX CLI to scaffold out NGRX apps. There's router store for connecting Angular's router directly to your NGRX application. Data for making it a little bit easier to consume APIs if you want to do that kind of thing. And there's ngx.io, which all of the documentation and architecture I've gone through is all documented on ngx.io if you want to learn even more. So I really appreciate your time today. And again, my name is Mike Ryan. You can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, and Medium at Mike Ryan Dev. And I want to thank you for all y'all's time. <laughs> that was amazing, Mike. I feel like if we had even stopped for questions, like, there's no way we would have gotten through all that. So <laughs> thank you for all that. Again, Mike is amazing. He's on Twitter. He is always super helpful. So um, if you didn't get your questions answered, definitely hit him up on Twitter. Uh, he's awesome. So yeah, thank you, Mike. And thank you everyone for coming.